here are some really hard revision questions for you. So these are the questions. You can either pause the video here and work through them or then check your answers, or you can just work straight through the video working along with me. I generally do these as six marks per question. Working on marking minute, it should take you about an hour to mark all of these. Um, if you're not sure about any of my answers, you want me to check any of your answers, just pop them in the comments below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So here we are going to have our calcium atom. We are going to have protons and neutrons in the middle here. And if we look at our periodic table, we will see that calcium, I'll just sketch it, um, down here has a mass number of 40 and an atomic number of 20, which means it's going to have 20 um, protons and 40 minus 20 equals 20 neutrons. Also means it's going to have 20 electrons and it is in uh, period 4, which means it is going to have 1, 2, 3, 4 shells and it is in group 2, so that means it's going to have 2 electrons on its outer shell. Now you should remember the electron shells fill up 2882. Two electrons in the outer shell. Calcium is going to be the most complicated one that I'm going to expect you to draw. So let me just pop these electrons in here for you. So this is a very complicated question. They wouldn't ask you to do all of this in one go. Um, but I'll give you one mark saying protons are in the nucleus and that there are 20 of them. Another mark saying pro neutrons are in the nucleus and there are 20 of them. And then the last two marks are going to be for drawing the electronic structure um, correctly. Hydrophilic and hydrophobic is something that is only going to come up in the higher tier um, and is quite a complicated question. But you have to know that in a emulsifier looks a bit like this. Um, it is going to have a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. Now hydrophilic means loves water and hydrophobic means hates water. So when we get a droplet of oil in a suspension of water, the hydrophobic tails are going to be the ones that come into the middle here, and then the hydrophilic heads are going to be the ones that sit on the outside. And this is how we can get an emulsion using the hydrophobic and the hydrophilic ends. Um, to make the oil combined with the water on the outside. So I'm going to give you uh, one mark for a hydrophilic, loves water, hydrophobic, hates water, and then another couple of marks for drawing um, the how we can use them to make an oil and motion between oil and water, so the actual use uh, of the different parts uh, for hydrophobic and hydrophilic. If you've drawn uh, a different diagram um, which shows that the hydrophobic head is attracted to oil and the hydrophilic head is attracted to water, that's also absolutely fine. So explain my building when blinds so might not be safe to enter after a fire. Um, for this you need to know your um, limestone circle. So we have limestone when we heat it up, it turns into calcium oxide, and we have the carbon dioxide, which goes away here. Now, what? hopefully you've done this experiment in the lab. Um, what you should recognise is that uh, limestone is a very hard solid, and that calcium oxide is a crumbly solid. And this happened after it had been heated, and the technical term for this is thermal decomposition. Now, um, 
Yeah, I would expect this um, if you're one of my students written out in praise, but these are things that I would give Mark for. So I'd give Mark for saying that um, calcium carbonate started off as limestone. Another Mark for saying um, that it thoroughly decomposed and he explained that you needed heat to break it down into two different things. I would give you one mark for each of the products and then for saying that the calcium oxide is a crumbly solid and if you have a building which is made out of a crumbly solid it's very likely to fall down after there's been a fire. So describe the process of polymerization and use chloroethene as an example. So I picked chloroethene because it's one that you may not have come across before. But what they really like to do in the exams is to give you something unusual and then ask you to polymerise it. So here is chloroethene. This is our monomer. And what's going to happen is this double bond down here is going to break. It is going to like flip out to either side and then to become a polymer. So the way we draw this is with long arms out here exactly the same in the middle and then square brackets around it and a little n after it to show you that it goes on and on and on you should be um, confident in drawing a polymer from a monomer even if it's something that you've never seen before so um, most of the marks are going to come from doing the polymer. So I'll give you one mark for drawing. Uh, even if you only drew it easy, you know, I'll still give you a mark for putting in the double bond there. And another mark for saying the double bond's broken. A mark for putting in the square brackets. And then a mark for popping the N afterwards. I'll give you a mark for saying it's a monomer. And then for identi correctly identifying this as poly, chloro, Ethene. Because to turn a monomer into a polymer, if you want to name it, all we need to do is pop poly in front of it, and that will be our polymer. So, for Wegener's theory, I'm going to start with the evidence. There are two main pieces of evidence. They are the fact that there are fossil records that appear to match up and the coastline of the different countries appear to match up. So even though they may have a separated and in some cases twisted round, we can always put them back together and see that the coastlines match up and the fossil uh, patterns match up as well. So those are the two main pieces of evidence for um, Wagner's theory. If we just skip to the reaction, um, this was very negative because he had no um, real evidence for it. People didn't really understand um, how things could move. This was this was a very very long time ago. Um, people believed what the Bible told them that um, Earth was created as it was. And they didn't really believe um, in fossils. Um, and so his reaction, the reaction to it was very, very negative. And it ended um, quite badly for Wegener. Um, he actually died in um, somewhere very, very snowy. And his body was eventually found under, under a pile of stone. It was really quite sad. Um, the proposed mechanism. We have the crust sitting on top. And the crust is made up of lots of different plates. The mantle which is underneath the crust, is liquid, and it is very hot down the bottom. And as hot liquids come up, they become less dense and rise. When they get to the top, they're not being heated anymore, so they become more dense and they drop down. So this was a convection current. Now, one of the problems is that Wegener couldn't propose the mechanism for this. Um, he just saw the evidence and uh, suggested it. Now that we have the uh, the mechanism, that the evidence can be looked at more closely, we can see that Wegener's idea was actually correct. So, marks for this. I'm going to give you one mark for each piece of evidence, one mark for um, the reaction, and then mark for um, convection currents, that it happens in the mantle, and the tectonic plates on the crust are the bits that actually move around. 
the early atmosphere is very different from the one um, that we have today. It was mainly made up of carbon dioxide, some ammonia, and then a little bit of methane in there as well. And there are a number of ways that this changed. So the carbon dioxide was used in photosynthesis. And this produced a lot of the oxygen. A lot of the carbon dioxide was also dissolved in the oceans. After the, um, after the green plants had developed and started taking hold, there was a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere, which we acted with the other two things. So the ammonia and the oxygen reacted together to give nitrogen and water, which you should know are big, big gases in um, today's atmosphere. And the methane reacted together with the oxygen to give carbon dioxide and water again. So quite a lot of things going on here. Um, so carbon dioxide, ammonia and methane, one each uh, for each of those. And then photosynthesis, this is the really big thing that it was the development of the, the, the evolution of green plants that really, really kick-started it, and the production of oxygen. And the fact that oxygen um, went on to react with the ammonia and the methane to produce other things. You don't have to have the word equations in here, you don't have to have the chemical equations in here, um, but these are really, really good to know if you have time to learn them. So this kind of question where they make up um, metals that you've never heard of for generally freaks people out, but all you need to do is think about it logically and um, realise that you know exactly what to do. You just need to think about this. So it says trainer oxide was reacted with pure um, carboltium and nothing happened. So if we're trying to work out the um, reactivity of these things, we know that in the reactivity series, the more reactive things are at the top, the less reactive things are at the bottom, and in displacement reaction, the more reactive things will take things away from the less reactive things. So if trainer oxide was reacted with carboltium and nothing happened, it would suggest that tritium is more reactive than carboltium. But it was then reacted, tritium oxide was then reacted with pure Harbold and a reaction was seen. So Harbold would suggest that it's more reactive than tritium. Give the order of reactivity and explain your reasoning. Predict what would happen with Harbold oxide is reacted with chromium. So my prediction would be that nothing would happen because tritium oxide is more reactive than carboltium. So I'll give you one mark each for the order and one mark for a prediction. And if you write me a couple of sentences with the explanation, then that's where you can get the rest of your marks from. So the difference between crude oil and petrol can sometimes seem quite abstract to people. Um, but crude oil is under the ground. Uh, it could also be under the sea. Um, there are a lot of oil tankers um, out at sea uh, digging up uh, oil, oil rigs, digging up um, crude oil. So the crude oil, it needs to be pumped up through um, um, an oil rig or a, a drilling station and then it needs to be piped to somewhere and then it's probably going to go in a lorry. Um, where it gets driven to be fractionally distilled. And then the fractional distillation is the part where it separates it off into petrol, diesel, or the really thick stuff down at the bottom of the bitumen. Now the longer things like diesel can be cracked
to make petrol because longer hydrocarbons aren't very useful whereas the shorter hydrocarbons are actually quite useful. So I'm going to give you um, a couple of marks for saying that the crude oil comes from underground. Oh, it has to be extracted from underground. So it's going to need to undergo fractional distillation. That is going to need to be separated. The short ones are going to come out the top, the long ones are going to come out at the bottom. That the longer ones can be cracked um, to make more useful things such as petrol. So this is a tricky question because of this word here, um, evaluate. It means you have to give some good things, which you have to give some bad things, and then you have to give an opinion. So whenever you see um, a question that has different parts to it, I always like my students to draw a table. That way we know we can get at least three things in here, at least three things in there, and then we should be hitting all of our marks. So um, ethanol as a biofuel. If we start with the environmental reasons, there are no polluting gases. So it's non-polluting, it doesn't contribute to climate change, uh, global warming. Or acid rain. A good thing, another good thing about it is that it's carbon neutral. So when we're growing the um, sugar cane, it takes in um, takes in carbon, and then when we we're using it as biofuel, it gives out carbon um, as well. And it's also non-harmful. So that's not to say it's not dangerous, it's not harmful. So if it spills, um, it's going to break down a lot quicker, whereas um, a petrol or a diesel spill, I'm sure you've seen the pictures of the news of the birds covered in um, oil spills, um, a biofuel is going to break down a lot, lot quicker. So the ethical um, issues around it are the land use. So the land that we use for... Um, Producing the, the sugar cane could be used to produce food, which could be used to feed uh, starving people um, around the world. We are also going to be destroying habitats when we use land for this. Um, we could be um, chopping down trees. Um, they could be destroying uh, habitats of birds, animals or even plants. But it is renewable, which means we're um, not going to run out of it. Um, it it's going to mean it's always there, um, and it's a long-term solution for the future. Now, because this is an evaluate question, not just to describe the advantages and disadvantages question, we have to give an opinion. Now, it really doesn't matter uh, what your opinion is, as long as you justify it. So, I think biofuels are a good thing because they're renewable and carbon neutral, or I think biofuels are a bad thing because they're using up land space which could be used to feed starving people. Um, as long as you justify your opinion, you're absolutely fine, um, just don't forget to give that opinion. So when we are hardening um, an unsaturated hydrocarbon, what we have is something that has a double bond in it, and we are going to be adding hydrogen into that to basically get rid of the double bond. Now the conditions that you're going to need to do this are with a catalyst and it's going to be 60 degrees. Now this is a lovely one to get marks from so I'm going to give you um, a mark for each of the conditions. I'm going to give you a mark for the double bond uh, turning it into a single bond and then you can have a last mark for make you all the way to the end here just as a final little tip um, if you're ever asked for the conditions for something and you can't remember them just say uh, catalyst and high temperatures because you know 75% of the time that's going to be the answer mm -hmm. Thanks for watching, I really hope this is helpful. Subscribe so you don't miss any of my new videos. Share to help your friends get better grades. Any comments, corrections, questions or requests down below please.